Good evening, my fellow scientists. Today I want to talk about two things. First, the all-iron battery, and second, bioanalytical chemistry. For the all-iron battery, we've been working hard trying to make a simpler version of the iron chemistry. For those of you who may be new here, two years ago we started by making an iron anode and an iron-3 salt cathode, and rigged those up to store and then discharge energy. Worked reasonably well, but it was very, very slow to discharge. We were able to speed it up somewhat with a whole bunch of conductive carbon, but we were looking for a simpler chemistry and maybe a faster chemistry to work in this battery. But so far, all of our results have been bad. So we've swapped out the iron sulfate for iron ammonium sulfate. We've tried potassium ammonium sulfate. We've tried different pHs. We've tried different formulations, concentrations of chloride. We've tried moving to entirely different uh, electrolytes and really have been completely skunked. So a bit of a bummer, but we're going back to the iron 1.0 chemistry and we're going to try to reformulate it for a little bit of simplicity. We did also try making one chemistry, so all iron 2, and then we start from a discharge state and charge it up. This also failed, so we're going to have to go back to the iron 2 and the iron 3 solutions as the starting point. We're going to try to make that a little simpler and a little more precise uh, for folks who may be interested in constructing it. In the meantime, I'll keep you updated. On the bioanalytical side, it's not all that often that bioanalytical chemistry comes to the forefront in sort of, ah, the news, but the last few weeks have been big. People have been wondering about the coronavirus test. I put up a video last week about the qPCR test. My lab actually works on more isothermal tests. So qPCR requires that a temperature start low and then go high and then go low and high and go low and high. And that's what drives the first denaturation and then renaturation of the DNA to allow the multiple cycles of amplification. That thermal cycler equipment is a little bit complicated to be able to precisely control those temperature changes and make the reaction run. So we work on reactions that don't require temperature changes. These are the kind of reactions you could imagine going on the kind of test strip, but are as sensitive as those PCR assays that are the sort of gold standard right now for virus testing. So I'm obviously very invested in this kind of chemistry and glad to see it come to the forefront. And I certainly hope that funding agencies and the public as well as politicians all take notice of just how important that kind of research is, including the basic stuff, the new ideas that are going to be driving the next generation of test kits for you know, the next 20 or 30 years. So one of the key questions in any bioanalytical framework is how do you recognize the biomolecule you really want to test? So in the case of a virus, you could go after the viral RNA or DNA, and you could use RNA or DNA to bind to that, and that could give you your hook to detect the thing you're interested in. So for a qPCR test, those are those magical primers. Those are little pieces of DNA that are going to attach to the viral DNA and allow you to copy it and ultimately replicate it and ultimately amplify it to the point where you can see it. But what about non-DNA? What about proteins? What about you know, lipopolysaccharides from other pathogens? How do you detect things that aren't DNA? And the answer there is usually using an antibody. And antibodies have wonderful advantages. They're extremely strong. They're extremely specific. They're made by you know, animals to fight off pathogens, so they have to be strong and specific. The downside, of course, is that because they're made by animals, they tend not to be very stable. They're more like meat than they are like the drugs we usually think of you know, taking as a therapeutic. You know, more, more like a steak than like aspirin in some regards. So antibodies are sort of the thing we want to get past if we can. And the big dream is someday you could take the genome of a virus, predict what protein were going to be made by that virus, predict what other proteins would bind to those proteins, and use that as the bioanalytical hook to detect the virus. Now, we're not there yet. Science just can't reliably go from genome to protein to protein that binds. But every year we get a little closer. So these are the kind of things that I dream about. I hope you find that interesting. Do tune in every week to this little vlog on the adventures we have in science.